Unspun's North Star is to get to a 1% reduction in global carbon emissions. 1% is massive. That's a like change how woven products are made in the entire industry and have near 100% penetration on that. And then we start getting close. We think of our role in the fashion industry as really allowing consumer behavior to continue to exist as it is, but better matching supply and demand and being able to find these billion dollar opportunities that also are the most sustainable step that a large brand can make at the same time. We are at Unspun's micro factory in Oakland, and here we are building a more profitable and sustainable apparel industry by automating the core manufacturing process. My co-founder Beth was the original visionary of Unspun. She was working in the outdoor industry. I was going to say she was inspired, but I think the better phrase is she was appalled at how they would sit in these meetings and talk about like the little bag for their cliff bar wrapper. But then at the same meeting, start talking about like, we have 400 something extra tents. And if we donate them and there's homeless people sleeping in tents with our logo on it, the brand looks bad. So we better burn these. And she was like, what? Like these two things happened in the same meeting. She was really inspired and in thinking about what a new manufacturing process would be that, you know, it's just kind of peak 3D printing boom. Like what if we could just 3D print something right when we need it? So this really got her thinking about on-demand manufacturing, the inherent automation necessary for that, but also like why is everything currently done in such a slow and wasteful process? The apparel industry is one where it's just standard that what if we just destroyed one in five cars that came off of uh, the Tesla assembly line or something like that? $200 billion a year spent making stuff, moving it around, and then lighting it on fire. Like that's such an obvious thing of like, hey, what if we just didn't do that? It means that there's just such a massive financial capitalist upside to be had in can you figure out how to not make this much stuff? Can you figure out how not to waste it? What I have constantly been really excited about is this intersection between that Venn diagram circle of profitability with sustainability. And that being like this very core, like, duh, of course this needs to happen type thing. Fundamentally being able to better manufacture products only when you need it by shrinking your whole manufacturing footprint down and locating it closer to where those garments are actually going to go really changes the overall business model of how the apparel industry produces things. It's a super brittle process in its current form and a really unique one to me as a robotics engineer and that as soon as someone figures out how to automate that manufacturing work, it's not a gradual change, but the whole like magnetic reversal of the poles type thing. One of the really fascinating things about apparel manufacturing, it's almost like if you <laughs> nerd, if you can graph tangent about the origin, you get this like asymptote right at zero, where it's impossibly difficult for robotics to do still, but pretty impossibly easy for human. And yet we can automate car manufacturing and we can build those with robots, but we can't do soft goods yet. Because you really start crumbling at this problem of soft fabric on a table, using our eyes to recognize which things to align, using our fingers to run it through the sewing machine. It ends up being a, a really difficult classical robotics problem. We were saying, okay, wait, if we want to go from fibers to garments as fast as possible, the most efficient way to do something is not to do it. Can you skip as many of those steps? Can you combine things, basically simplify the process as your fundamental route towards automation? Our fundamental approach was do everything at once. Can we combine all of these processes and go directly from yarn to as close to a finished garment as possible? And our route to that is 3D weaving. So taking a bunch of yarns, about 3,000 of them, and weaving them all together at once to build seamless structures. So think about like removing the side seam on your pants, eliminating the seam all the way around on a shirt. So yarns in and nearly finished garments out. Specifically, we think about 3D weaving tubes, but tubes that can change diameter. So. If that old world, the basic building block of a pair of pants is a front panel, a back panel, a left panel, a right panel, those all come together, we think about a left tube and a right tube. Or a shirt would be a really big tube with an aggressive taper and two little tubes coming off of it. By kicking that like basic Lego block dimension up one, building from 3D structures rather than 2D planes, it allows us to do a lot more all at once 
and better kind of optimize that curve between how fast you can make something, but also how variable you can make something. It's kind of like this fundamental automation play of if you want to be able to do a lot of different things, your process slows way down. If you want to just do the same thing over and over and over, you can often do that really fast. By building from these creels of thousands of yarns all coming in, we have these other parts that are weaving in and out. Knits and wovens are kind of those two main categories. Knits is like a t-shirt, very loopy and stretchy. Wovens is like that over under checkerboard process, much more technical, much stronger, um, often why it's used in like carbon fiber and composites as well. So we specifically focus on weaving and doing this 3D weaving process, letting us build from these tubular building blocks. And then that process happens super, super fast. The hardest technical part of building Vega and bringing this 3D weaving process to life is I think really just like the scale of how big and how many things are happening to make one of these machines work. We have about 3,000 individual actuators. All of those actuators are moving things around in this process as we have these other things spinning around. We're basically updating 20 to 30,000 variables a second. And these aren't software variables. These are like physical positions of things. Even as we prototype one little thing and then we need to then test it on the machine, like we're effectively doing production runs of thousands of units, even at the very beginning of that prototype phase. A massive amount of effort going into actually building an industrial process that doesn't just work at lab scale, but works at the scale needed to ultimately be getting to those cost and efficiency curves that make sense in a effectively commodities product. This thing needs to operate all day, every day, or ever, or as close to that as you can get it. Suddenly, the most efficient way to make something is no longer some centralized factory in Asia. It's right next to where it's going to be sold. It's can you have something bought online, routed to the nearest factory, produced and delivered and still do all of that in that like two or three day window that people expect. We think of ourselves really fundamentally addressing automation in a soft goods manufacturing world, as well as all of the order management and software needed to go from like a buy button being clicked on a website to a factory turning on somewhere else. If you want to actually have a shot at making a massive impact, then you need to make the most profitable, fastest, best, cheapest thing that just so happens to be sustainable. At least within the uh, fashion industry, that's been a very unique take. But fundamentally, one we think is super important. Otherwise, you're constantly having to push things uphill. You're constantly fighting the paper straw thing. Like nobody wants a t-shirt that falls apart after three or four wears. Like it still has to be the best product. On the business side, it needs to be a more profitable way of producing things that just so happens to be much more sustainable and have a significantly lower carbon footprint. The entire industry is really reliant on access to ultra cheap labor and effectively minimum human rights rules, which means low prices as well. Then it turns into these like 18 month timelines where brands have to commit to size, quantities, colors of like the Topeka, Kansas store. Maybe that worked back when fashion was just like, what three colors do we put on our GAP sweatshirt? But that doesn't work anymore. And it definitely doesn't work in a world where fashion's like, what was happening on TikTok last week. Automation really here is going to be uh, the foundational layer of how the fashion industry even becomes significantly more sustainable. So the, the next big milestone for us is taking this proof of concept microfactory, plopping it into an actual production environment in Europe and starting to build our 3D weaving hub there, as well as plopping a much bigger one down in North America, building out that way. And we'll start building these hubs and put lots and lots of machines in one single location so that we have a 3D weaving hub for all of the Americas somewhere in North America and then in Europe producing for that entire segment there. I cannot imagine two more orthogonal vectors than robotics manufacturing and couture fashion, right? Like it's, it's such a hilarious combination of branding and image and at the same time like grease and manufacturing. Getting to exist in the intersection of these two is so much fun because both worlds are almost like so foreign and alien to each other. Getting to then start bending some of the rules and like, hey, no, our industrial machine should be beautiful and visually appealing. Actually, no, we're not going to cover up all of the mess that exists in the apparel industry. We actually want to bring 
customers and people into how their products are actually made. So it's it's really this fun intersection of like deeply technical work with you know the very like human expression part of apparel and fashion.